It is my great honor to join you all this morning at the World Sustainable Built Environment Conference 2017. First, a warm welcome to you all, especially guests from the mainland and overseas who have traveled all the way to Hong Kong to share the vision and insights on the important theme of transforming our built environment through innovation and integration, putting ideas into action. The World Sustainable Building Conference is held every three years, as we all know, to provide a worldwide platform for governments, international institutions, and experts from across the world to have in-depth discussions and exchanges on the latest developments in sustainable buildings and the challenges ahead. The conference is highly regarded as one of the most important platforms for driving sustainable built environment on the global level. The whole such a world-class event in Hong Kong clearly demonstrates our aspiration to play a leading role in driving the transformation of the global built environment. I should add that today's conference, in fact, is one of the major invest signature events marking our return to the motherland and the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. So it has a very special significance indeed. With a population density of 27,330 persons per square kilometer, Hong Kong is one of the world's most densely populated cities. Occupying only 1,110 square kilometers of land, we have a population of over 7.3 million. Given the severe geographical constraints of hilly terrain, the land readily suitable for people to live and work here is just 268 square kilometers in area, or 24% of the total land area. As a metropolis with very limited land resources, Hong Kong is a perfect venue to host this world-renowned conference for exchanging views and experience about sustainable urban development. Put simply, our passion and aspiration are grounded in our conviction in balanced development and our pursuit for excellency. Development of a sustainable and livable city is a multifaceted endeavor. Like many well-developed metrop metropolitan cities in other parts of the world, Hong Kong is facing a number of changing circumstances and challenges, including the evolving global and regional dynamics, a rapidly aging population, pressing demand for housing, economic activities, and community facilities, as well as a growing aspiration for more living space and better quality of life. Hong Kong needs to respond strategically to meet these challenges and tap new opportunities. The territorial development strategy we adopted is to develop Hong Kong into a livable, competitive, and sustainable Asia's world city. To this end, we announced the Hong Kong 2030 Plus towards a planning vision and strategy transcending 2030, a vision-driven, pragmatic, and action-oriented plan last year. <clears throat> the plan aims to guide Hong Kong's development in different aspects of the built environment, from land use planning to buildings, transport and infrastructure, with a view to enhancing livability and this densely populated city, creating capacity for sustainable growth and embracing economic challenges and opportunities. <coughs> Our population will continue to grow over the next 30 years. It will increase from about 7.3 million at present and peak at about 8.22 million in 2043, before reaching 7.81 million by 2064. Despite the growth, our population is aging rapidly. At present, one in 6.5 persons in Hong Kong is aged 65 or above. However, in 20 years' time, the ratio will rise to one in three. The population of the old old, OO means those elderly aged 85 and above, will rise from the current 2.2% to over 10% by the year 2064. So one-tenth of the population will be over 85 by the year 2064. The demographic changes and aging trend call for a forward-looking planning of solution space in Hong Kong. As we have identified various new development areas in the northern parts of the new territories, namely Kutong, Fenian North, and Hong Sui Kyu, as shaded purple uh, in the map before you, <coughs> a smart city approach 
should be embraced to meet our needs for housing, community facilities, hospitals, infrastructure, and open spaces in the long term. The crux to the problem, obviously, is to manage density pro properly and strike an appropriate balance between providing adequate housing and ensuring a livable environment. To meet the growing demand for housing development, we have embarked on a 10-year housing program with the target of providing 460,000 housing units by the year 2025 to 2026. I should add here that of Hong Kong's entire population, 40% are living in government-built and heavily subsidized housing. So really four out of 10 Hong Kong residents. The Hong Kong SAL government plays a proactive role in providing 200,000 public housing units and 80,000 subsidized housing flats, which together account for 60% of a housing development target in the next 10 years. The remaining 40% of the target will be achieved through private housing development. In the next three to four years, we expect 96,000 units will be supplied by the primary private residential property market. Hopefully, this will dampen the property price here. While we have a rapidly aging population, we have an even more rapidly aging building stock that poses health and safety risks for the whole community. Owners are responsible in Hong Kong for timely maintenance of their buildings, but many of them find the relevant procedures rather daunting. To help revitalize our building stock, the Urban Renewal Authority has adopted redevelopment and rehabilitation as its core businesses since the introduction of the 2011 Urban Renewal Strategy comprising redevelopment, rehabilitation, heritage preservation, and revitalization. As yet, at the end of last year, 62 redevelopment projects have been implemented, with 712 buildings redeveloped, 12,100 households rehoused or compensated, and 25,500 people benefited in the end. To help expedite the revitalization process, we have earmarked in this year's government budget 300 million Hong Kong dollars to allow owners to participate in the Smart Tender Building Rehabilitation Facilitating Services Scheme run by the Urban Renewal Authority at a concessionary rate. It is estimated that owners of about 4,500 buildings will benefit from this initiative in the next five years. So urban renewal here is obviously a major challenge for Hong Kong. In view of the demographic changes, especially our aging population, there is clearly a pressing demand for us to enhance the overall capacity of our public health care system in order to meet the rising healthcare needs of Hong Kong. To expand and upgrade healthcare facilities in a more flexible and long-term manner, we earmarked a total provision of 200 billion Hong Kong dollars, yes, 200 billion Hong Kong dollars, amounting to 25.8 billion US dollars, last year for the implementation of the 10-year hospital development plan. In essence, the plan will cover the redevelopment and expansion of some 11 hospitals across the territory. As for new hospital projects, an acute general hospital will be built in the Kai Tak development area, the site of the former Kai Tak airport, providing an oncology center and a first neuroscience center in Hong Kong. This vast investment in our public healthcare system will provide 5,000 additional hospital beds, representing a rise of 18%. Operating theaters will increase by 40% to 320 Specialist outpatient service capacity will also be expanded substantially by 40% from 6.8 million to 10 million attendances a year. Also, additional services for 410,000 attendances will be provided at the general outpatient clinics each year. So we're talking about a major ambitious hospital expansion program to cook with Hong Kong's needs and an aging population. At present, the public health care sector uh, still accounts, accounts for some 90% of inpatient services in Hong Kong and serves as the safety net for those in need, particularly at this advantage. For our visitors, let me, let me just add the point that uh, we heavily subsidize medical services in Hong Kong. 98% uh, subsidy from the government. You only pay 2% in terms of public hospital system. And 
percent of inpatient services are said, you know, relying on the government. So it's a, a huge um, supplier, huge provider here of, of medical service in Hong Kong. To provide patients with more choices and offer healthcare professionals alternative career development options, we also, of course, need a dynamic and vibrant private healthcare sector here. Earlier this year, a new private hospital offering 500 hospital beds has commenced services. The government has also provided a loan of 4 billion Hong Kong dollars for the Chinese University of Hong Kong to develop a non-profit making private hospital. In addition, we have allocated 10 billion Hong Kong dollars to the hospital authority for setting up a public-private a public -private partnership fund to generate investment returns for funding clinical PPP programs and initiatives. To meet the rising demand for additional places for elderly and rehabilitation services, we introduced also the special scheme on privately owned sites for welfare users back in the year 2014 through an injection of 10 billion Hong Kong dollars to the Lotteries Fund. Some 40 NGOs in Hong Kong have submitted over 60 project proposals to make better use of the sites owned by them through expansion, in, in situ redevelopment or new development. So far, one project has been completed, whereas three are scheduled to complete this year, while two coming up in 2018-19. It is expected that this scheme will provide around 9,000 additional elderly service places and 8,000 additional rehabilitation service places in Hong Kong. According to, the, to a worldwide, very interesting figures here, according to a worldwide skyscrapers database, Hong Kong is ranked first globally with over 1,300 skyscrapers, near the double that of New York City. Tokyo is 489, New York is 730, you can see from the PowerPoint here. In Hong Kong, power generation accounts for 70% of local carbon emission. Buildings in Hong Kong consume 90% of electricity and thus account for 60% of our greenhouse gas emission. The enhancement of the environmental performance of our building stock is therefore the key to promoting sustainable built environment. And our building stock, of course, is the culprit, uh, polluting the environment here. To improve the environmental performance of our building stock, we have implemented a range of policies and measures including legislation, incentive programs, and government leadership. I will explain further here. While we, may, we are making good progress in rejuvenating our buildings, we have also implemented various measures to, to green our built environment. We have introduced legislation to require new buildings and buildings that are undergoing major retrofitting to comply with minimum energy efficiency standards in order to enhance the energy efficiency performance of buildings. Hotels and commercial buildings are further required to comply with the statutory standard to reduce heat transfer through building envelopes, thereby saving energy consumption for air conditioning. The mandatory standards are developed with reference to the latest developments in technology and practices and are subject to regular reviews. We are also an international pioneer in requiring commercial building owners to carry our mandatory energy audits once every 10 years and to publish the audit results. To take the need, the government has set specific electricity reduction targets for some 8,000 government buildings or facilities and has cut power consumption by about 40%, uh, 15% from the year 2003 to 2014, and is now working towards a further 5% saving by the year 2020, using 2014 as the base year. We also require all newly built government buildings to obtain at least the second highest grade under the Buildings Environmental Assessment Method Plus Rating System, the BIM Plus in short, operated by the Hong Kong Green Building Council. Up to now, some 100 government building projects have been registered under BIM Plus certification. To encourage the private building sector to improve the performance of the buildings, we have promulgated a set of sustainable building design guidelines under which developers may obtain gross floor area, GFA concessions, and new buildings by incorporating sustainable design elements and providing equal related information. So far, 25 million square meters and 10 million square meters of floor space have been registered and certified respectively under BIM Plus. To further promote the BIM Plus system, we require all new private buildings to register for BIM Plus certification in order to obtain bonus GFA for certain green features. To date, about 800 private development projects have gone through or registered for such certification. 
The commitment and leadership demonstrated by the government, as well as the tangible outcomes of our efforts, provide the driving force for the non-government sector to take positive action to enhance the green performance of their buildings. Our determination to promote sustainable built environment is further evidenced by putting the idea of hosting this world-renowned international conference in Hong Kong into action. As, as of today, we have 1,800 experts from 55 countries across six continents gathering at this grand hall to celebrate the opening of the World Sustainable Built Environment Conference 2017 in this Asia's world city. Green space is an integral part of a livable compact metropolis. In Hong Kong, we have 443 square kilometers of land. It's designated for country parks and special areas protected by law from any development. Another 100 square kilometers of land is zoned conservation area, coastal protection area, and sites of special scientific interest on statutory town plans. Hong Kong people, we are very lucky. We are privileged to enjoy convenient access to these natural assets. About 85% of our population are living within three kilometers from a country park, and 90% within 400 meters from a park in close proximity. The city is also our main act act activity area. We consider urban design and landscaping to be the key components of a quality urban environment. To this end, we have introduced a greening master plan to develop and implement greening works for the urban areas. Within the 10 years from 21, 2001 to 2011, we planted over 18.8 18 million, 18 million trees across the whole territory here. Hong Kong is a place, we are a place known for working very hard and also we play hard. And we have much to offer in the form of culture, sports, and leisure. We are taking big strides to establish Hong Kong as a major cultural hub. The West Kowloon Cultural District, WKCD in short, is our long-term strategic development and investment in arts and cultural hardware to meet the growing cultural needs of the public attract and nurture artistic talent, foster the development of creative industries, and further strengthen Hong Kong's status as an international hub of art and culture. The M Plus Pavilion, the first permanent facility in WKCD, is now in operation. The completion of a host of other world-class facilities will follow suit. We will have the CG Center by late 2017, the art park, including the free space with the black box theater and an outdoor street from 2018 in stages, the 60,000 square meters M plus building in 2018, and the lyric theater complex by the year 2021. In terms of infrastructure, we're also seeing major infrastructure development for sports in Hong Kong. We are pressing ahead with the development of the Kai Tak Spot Sports Park. Kai Tak is the former airport, as you know, using the tarmac. The Kai Tak Spot Sports Park, which will spread across about 28 meters the hectares of land, with key sports facilities including a 50,000 seat main stadium, a 5,000 seat public sports ground, a multi-purpose indoor sports, sports center with playing service of 30 standard badminton courts, and a landscape park of more than seven hectares for the public to relax or enjoy outdoor exercise. To further promote healthy living in this densely built city, we have also earmarked in this year's government budget, 20 billion Hong Kong dollars for 26 sports and recreational facilities projects in the coming five years in different districts with a view to improving health, relieving stress, encouraging active aging, and ultimately alleviating the burden on public health services in the end. Our world reliant Victoria Harbour our precious asset is at the center of the dense urban core. We are determined to enliven the harbor front along the Victoria Harbor for public enjoyment. We have installed waterfront promenades in different districts and introduced new attractions on the central harbor front. The Hong Kong Observation Wheel has attracted over 1 million visitors since it was launched in 2014. The Central Harbour Front event space has, has already hosted over 185 arts, cultural and recreational events. Hong Kong is a small open economy with a large population as we all know. To sustain our development, we need to look beyond Hong Kong and have the determination and capability to go and seize opportunities. 
To this end, we are gearing up to capitalize on our motherland's Belt and Road Initiative. Inspired by two legendary economic corridors of ancient times, namely the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century Maritime Silk Road, this visionary initiative aims to enhance policy coordination, connectivity, trade, financial integration, and people-to-people -people links amongst over 60 countries around the world. Covering 4.4 billion people and accounting for over 30% of global economic value, the Belt and Road Initiative will surely create huge and fresh opportunities for all. Last year, the mainland of China's direct investment in Belt and Road countries amounted to 112 billion Hong Kong dollars, hence we should seize these opportunities and harness the benefits brought by this initiative through active participation. Given Hong Kong's geographical location and our strengths as an international strategic financial, investment and business hub, and our unique China advantage under the One Country, Two Systems framework, we are well placed and well prepared to play the role of a super connector between the mainland of China and the rest of the world. In parallel, we are also preparing a development plan for the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau Bay Area, as announced by Premier Li Keqiang this March in the Hong Kong Macau section of the Central Government's Work Report. This Bay Area, Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau Bay Area, important hinterland of Hong Kong, encompasses 11 cities, including Hong Kong and Macau, with a total, total population of 66 million people. The successful implementation of the plan will certainly open up more opportunities for cooperation between Hong Kong and the mainland to achieve mutual benefits. While we're on seizing the opportunities, I would also like to say that Hong Kong's strategic position has enabled us to serve as an international hub for access to business opportunities in the region and also a major gateway to the mainland of China. Well-developed infrastructure is a critical factor underpinning economic growth and strength. Since 2010, Hong Kong has ranked top in infrastructure by the World Economic Forum in seven years in a row reflecting the consistently outstanding quality of our facilities across all modes of transportation. The Hong Kong International Airport at Chek Lap Kok has been the busiest cargo airport in the world for the past seven years, and it's the world's third busiest, busiest international passenger airport. Half of the world's population is no more than five hours flying time from Hong Kong, while all of Asia's major markets such as Shanghai, Singapore, Seoul and Tokyo are less than four hours flight from Hong Kong. Our airport is serviced by more than 100 airlines, which operate around 1,100 1, flights a day, linking Hong Kong to about 190 destinations worldwide, including 50 cities in China. To ensure that Hong Kong remains a regional aviation hub, the airport authority is building the third runway. The project will require the reclamation of 650 hectares of land. Apart from the runway, additional taxiways, ramps, passenger transport and luggage processing facilities will also be built. The existing Terminal 2 will also be expanded to accommodate additional traffic. And job opportunities will double by the time the third runway um, come on stream. At the moment, 75,000 people are employed on the Chek Lap Kok Airport Island, and job will be doubled by the year 2028 when the new runway uh, comes in, into operation. Forming part of the national high-speed rail network um, is also important. Rail link is also important here. Now, forming part of the national high-speed rail network, the 142 kilometers, kilometers long Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong Express rail link will link Hong Kong with the Guangzhou South Station through Shenzhen. The Hong Kong section of the express rail link is about 26 kilometers long and will run along a dedicated underground rail corridor or below ground from a new terminus at West Kowloon to the boundary near Lok Ma Chow of connection with the mainland section of the express rail, the high-speed rail. This is our target of the Hong Kong section to commission by the third quarter of next year. On, commission, on the commissioning of the Hong Kong section of the high-speed rail, the journey time between Guangzhou and Hong Kong will be reduced from 100 minutes to, up, to about 50 minutes. Our aim is to achieve an one-hour living radius it will also take eight hours from us, for us from, from Hong Kong to reach Shanghai and 10 hours to Beijing. 
Locally, back in Hong Kong, the transport sector accounts for about 17% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. To improve our urban living conditions, we have developed a well-connected, comprehensive, and intermodal public transport system. Every day, about 90% of passenger trips, or over 12 million trips, are taken care of by our local transport system. For environmental and economic reasons, it is our policy to use railways as the backbone of our passenger transport system and to integrate transport and land use planning. To expand the transport infrastructure, three mass transit rail, railway MTL lines, namely the West Island Line, the Guntong Line Extension, and the South Island Line were commissioned in 2015 and 2016. To further enhance our network, we are now taking forward the MTL Line charting the central link and the cross-boundary express rail link that connect Hong Kong to the national high-speed rail grid on the mainland. Upon the completion by 2021, our railway network will cover more than 270 kilometers and areas inhabited by more than 70% of the entire population. But our transport network development does not stop here. The Railway Development Strategy 2014 recommended that seven other railway projects be implemented by the year 2026. When these projects are completed by 2031, the total length of the railways will increase to over 300 kilometers here and cover areas inhabited by 75% of the local population and 85% of workplaces of our population. The share of rail transport patronage will then rise to some 45 to 50 percent of public transport modes by 2031. In parallel, the government will continue to manage the private car fleet size and help reduce roadside emission in Hong Kong. A good example is the joint efforts with bus operators since 2013 on bus routes residualization to enhance network efficiency, ease traffic congestion, and reduce roadside air pollution. Between 2013 and 2016, a total of 31 bus routes with low patronage were cancelled or merged with other routes. Some 290 routes have been truncated or had their frequencies reduced. We also enhance connectivity and promote low carbon lifestyle within the urban areas by other means, including promoting walkability through planning and design of the built environment and pedestrian networks fostering a bicycle-friendly environment and promoting easy access to public transport and facilities. Innovation and technology certainly come into play here. So innovation technology will be the key driver for global economic development. It is for this reason that we set up the Innovation Technology Bureau during this term of government to drive our ambitious technology agenda and launch a variety of innovation and technology policies and initiatives, including supporting a 4.4 billion Hong Kong dollars expansion to the Hong Kong Science Park, home to some 600 technology startups and companies. At last count, Hong Kong is home now to more than 1,900 startups, and we are working to build on those numbers. Among other things, we have established a 2 billion Hong Kong dollar innovation technology venture fund partnering with private venture capital funds to help finance promising local technology startups. We have also introduced a 500 million Hong Kong dollars innovation and technology fund for better living to encourage the use of innovation and technology in, devel in developing projects to bring more convenience, comfort and safety to daily living or address the needs of specific community groups like the age community. To give further impetus to the innovation and technology development in Hong Kong, we have announced in this year's government budget that 10 billion Hong Kong dollars will be reserved for this good cause. We are putting more resources into our world-class universities and research and development institutions to help boost their mainstream applied research in key areas of technology. Also, we are liaising with top R&D institutions from all over the world, promoting Hong Kong as their gateway to Asia, and in particular, the mainland of China. Last year, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology opened its MIT Innovation Note in Hong Kong. Sweden's Karunitsky Institute, one of the world's leading medical universities, opened its first overseas research center in October 2016 at the Hong Kong Science Park. And the Ming Wai Lao Center for Reparative Medicine will target such areas as gene note editing, biomedical engineering, and 3D tissue imaging. 
It is the enchantment, it is our vision in Hong Kong to develop this completely built city into an efficient, practical, and smart metropolis. We have designated Kowloon East as our testing ground for the Smart City Initiative. Kowloon East comprises the Kai Tuk development area and the regeneration of two adjacent former industrial areas, Gun Tong and Kowloon Bay. We aim to transform the district into a sustainable business core that befits the, the, the concept of sustainability by making use of smart data and technology, creating a low carbon green community and enhancing walkability and mobility, improving resource management and promoting social vibrancy. We are studying the formulation of a smart city development blueprint for Hong Kong, which will map out short, medium and long-term measures up to 2030 to develop Hong Kong into a smart city. Making our city smart is essential for achieving a sustainable built environment in terms of low carbon emission and high energy efficiency. But we are, we are committed to developing Hong Kong into a livable city in a sustainable manner. We have not lost sight of the need to address the impact of extreme weather conditions caused by climate change of our society, our economy, as well as our daily life. As the historic Paris Agreement came into effect last November, the government has set up a high-level steering committee on climate change. The steering committee is chaired by, by me, by myself, and comprising all ministers in the government. Every one of them, no exemption at all. All 13 secretaries are involved under this committee, so steering committee. We, we mobilize, mobilize everybody, join hands, to coordinate efforts in combating climate change and achieving carbon reduction targets. Indeed, climate change has all along been placed high on the Hong Kong government's policy agenda. In 2015, we announced the Energy Saving Plan for Hong Kong with a target of reducing energy intensity by 40% by 2025 through a series of measures covering economic, regulatory, educational, and social aspects. The steering committee launched the Hong Kong Climate Action Plan 2030 plus earlier this year and set a new target of reducing carbon intensity by 65 to 70% by 2030 Compare with the 20, uh, compare with the 200, 2005 level, which is equivalent to an, an absolute reduction of 26 to 36 percent, or 3.3 to 3.8 percent, uh, sorry, 3.3 to 3.8 tons in per capita emissions by the year 2030. This is a rather ambitious target, reflecting clearly our determination to tackle the global issue of climate change head on. My colleague, K.S. Wong, Secretary for Environment, will share with you tomorrow in greater detail the planning strategy for a low-carbon city and the mitigation and adaptation actions to enhance Hong Kong's climate change readiness. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that what I've said just now is just some of the highlights of the Hong Kong government's dedicated efforts to pursue sustainable urban development. Our ultimate objective is to design and produce a strategic vision that can befit Hong Kong's landscape, population, and development needs, stand the test of time, and remain resilient in an ever-changing world. This meaningful event today would not have been possible without the unfailing support of some strong advocates, including the Hong Kong Green Building Council. I'm grateful for their efforts in organizing this valuable platform for experts from Hong Kong and the mainland and overseas to share their knowledge, ideas, and, and insights. Also, I'm delighted to meet you on this auspicious occasion where we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. But may I take this chance to wish the conference every success and our friends from mainland and overseas an enjoyable stay in this Asia's world city and do take time out to see a bit of Hong Kong and shop to boost our economy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.